you think Jesus was an alien? I think Jesus was half human, half alien, and I'll tell you why. Biblical text, also with the Torah, Bible, Quran, saying the same identical things as the ancient tablets. Billy Carson has just made jaw-dropping claims about Jesus Christ, proposing a theory so outlandish it'll make your head spin. Carson suggests Jesus wasn't just a spiritual leader, but an alien with mind-bending abilities. But that's not all. He argues that powerful forces have kept these earth-shattering truths hidden for centuries. Who is Carson, and can his controversial ideas rewrite religious history as we know it? How might the world change if his extraordinary claims turned out to be true? Join us as we uncover the truth about Billy Carson's statement that Jesus was an alien with proof. The man who may know more than the Pope. Born in 1971 in New York and raised in Miami's ghettos, Carson's journey from newspaper boy to renowned expert in ancient civilizations is a true representation of the American dream. At just 12, Carson began working for Miami News, saving money to kickstart his entrepreneurial career. By 16, he was dealing in digital car stereos, marking the beginning of his journey as a serial entrepreneur. His thirst for knowledge led him to pursue courses in neuroscience at MIT and ancient civilization at Harvard University. Carson's career took a significant turn in 2008 when he founded SheCanPlay.org, a nonprofit organization focused on girls' high school basketball. His entrepreneurial spirit continued to flourish as he took on roles such as CEO of Fort Terra Nova and president of Zenforce Media. In 2012, Carson founded Forbidden Knowledge Inc., initially a blog that evolved into a TV network showcasing conscious documentaries and shows. This platform became a cornerstone for Carson's exploration of unconventional ideas and theories. Carson's fascination with space and ancient mysteries led to the establishment of the First Class Space Agency in 2014. This nonprofit organization focuses on researching alternative propulsion systems and zero-point energy devices. Under this umbrella, Carson co-founded the United Family of Anomaly Hunters, pioneering new fields of study, archaeoastronomy and astroanthropology. But what drives a man to make such audacious claims? Carson's background offers some clues. A self-proclaimed expert in ancient history and space exploration, he has long been fascinated by the intersection of ancient civilizations and advanced technologies. His theories often challenge mainstream historical and religious narratives, proposing alternative explanations for events and figures that have shaped human belief systems. Throughout his career, Carson has worn many hats, entrepreneur, author, music artist, TV host, producer, actor, and director. He's been featured on major networks like the Travel Channel, the History Channel, and the Discovery Channel. As a two-time best-selling author, Carson hosts Deep Space, a series exploring the secret space program and advanced technologies. Carson's influence extends to the music industry with Pantheon Elite Records, a label featuring conscious music artists, including himself. He's also made his mark in the world of journalism, contributing to Thrive Global and registering as an international journalist. Revelations about Jesus' name. In the realm of spiritual exploration and ancient mysteries, few voices have stirred as much controversy as Billy Carson's. His latest revelation about Jesus has sent shockwaves through both religious and academic circles, challenging centuries-old beliefs and igniting fierce debates. Billy Carson's explosive claims about Jesus' extraterrestrial origins, a new thread of intrigue began to unravel. The very name Jesus itself, it seemed, held secrets that had been hiding in plain sight for centuries. Carson never one to shy away from controversy, dove headfirst into the linguistic labyrinth of Jesus' name, unearthing a tale that stretched back through time and across cultures. 
The story began, as so many do, with a simple truth. The letter J is a relatively recent addition to our alphabet. This seemingly innocuous fact opened a Pandora's box of questions about the name we've come to associate with one of history's most influential figures. Carson, with the enthusiasm of a detective hot on the trail of a long cold case, peeled back the layers of linguistic evolution to reveal a startling claim. The original name was not Jesus at all, but Isis. But Carson didn't stop there. With the relentless pursuit of a man uncovering a cosmic conspiracy, he pushed further, asserting that Isis carried a hidden meaning. In Greek, he claimed, it translates to Hail Zeus. The implications were staggering. Could it be that for centuries, people had been unknowingly invoking the Greek god Zeus when they spoke the name of Jesus? As if sensing the shockwaves his revelation would send through the religious world, Carson quickly pivoted. The real name, he insisted, was not Asus or Jesus, but Yeshua. This Hebrew name, meaning salvation or the Lord saves, brought the discussion back to more familiar theological ground, but the seed of doubt had already been planted. Carson's exploration of Jesus' name wasn't merely an exercise in linguistics. It was a gateway, a means of shifting the understanding of Jesus' identity and cultural context. By focusing on the name, Carson invited his audience to question everything they thought they knew about the central figure of Christianity. The story of Jesus' name, as Carson told it, was a journey through time and language. From the Hebrew Yeshua, the name transformed as it traveled across cultures and tongues. When the Old Testament was translated into Greek, Yeshua became Jesus. This Greek form of the name spread widely during the time of the New Testament, carrying Jesus' story to the Greek-speaking world. Turns out Carson was right. The name Jesus has a rich history stretching back many centuries. Yeshua was a common name at the time of Jesus' birth. In Hebrew culture, names often carried deep significance. Yeshua, or Joshua in English, symbolized hope and faith in God's power to save his people. When Jesus was born, an angel instructed his parents, Mary and Joseph, to name him Yeshua because he would save his people from their sins. Over time, as the name Yeshua was translated into different languages, it eventually became known as Jesus. But the journey didn't end there. As the Bible found its way into Latin, Jesus evolved once more, becoming Jesus. It was this Latin form that would eventually give rise to the name we know today. Over centuries, as Latin evolved into various European languages, Jesus underwent its final transformation, emerging as Jesus in English. Carson's narrative wove together linguistics, history, and theology into a tapestry that challenged conventional understanding. He painted a picture of a name that had traveled across continents and through centuries, picking up new sounds and meanings along the way. In doing so, he invited his audience to see Jesus, not just as a religious figure, but as a cultural phenomenon, whose very name bore the imprints of the civilizations it had touched. As Carson's narrative unfolded, it became clear that his interest in Jesus' name was part of a larger mission. He sought to strip away layers of tradition and dogma, to reveal what he saw as the true essence of Jesus' identity and message. The name in Carson's telling was more than just a label. It was a key to understanding the cultural and spiritual landscape of the ancient world. Jesus Travels and Education According to Carson As the echoes of Carson's revelations about Jesus' name faded, a new chapter in his unconventional narrative began to unfold. The exploration of Jesus' name had opened a door, and through it, Carson now ventured into even more contentious territory, the so-called lost years of Jesus' life. With the same enthusiasm he had applied to unravel the mystery of the name, Carson set out to paint a picture of Jesus' life that would challenge everything his audience thought they knew about the central figure of Christianity. Carson's narrative began with a simple question. 
what happened to Jesus during the years between his childhood and the beginning of his public ministry. These lost years, a period of silence in the biblical account, had long been a source of speculation among scholars and believers alike. But where others saw a gap in the historical record, Carson saw an opportunity to weave a tale of spiritual adventure and esoteric learning. With the confidence of a man who had unlocked an ancient secret, Carson asserted that during these lost years, Jesus had embarked on a journey of discovery that would take him to the far corners of the known world. Egypt, he claimed, was Jesus' first destination, a land steeped in mystery and ancient wisdom. Carson's Egypt was not just the land of pharaohs and pyramids, but a place of profound spiritual knowledge. Here, he claimed, Jesus had studied the Egyptian mysteries, delving into esoteric teachings that had been passed down through generations of priests and initiates. To support his claims, Carson pointed to the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, an apocryphal text excluded from the canonical Bible. This document, he insisted, held the key to understanding Jesus' Egyptian sojourn. But Carson didn't stop at mere assertion. With the zeal of a true believer, he claimed to have visited Egypt himself, identifying the very house where Jesus had lived and studied. This house, now a site of pilgrimage, stood as tangible proof of Jesus' time in Egypt, at least in Carson's telling. Yet it wasn't just the fact of Jesus' presence in Egypt that Carson found significant. It was who he studied with that truly set Carson's narrative apart. According to him, Jesus' teacher in Egypt was none other than Thoth, the Atlantean priest king. In Egyptian mythology, Thoth was revered as the god of wisdom, writing, and magic. But in Carson's telling, Thoth was more than a myth. He was a flesh and blood being of immense knowledge and power, the founder of many of Egypt's spiritual and mystical traditions. Under Thoth's tutelage, Carson claimed, Jesus had gained access to profound knowledge and spiritual practices that would later characterize his teachings. The wisdom of ancient Egypt, with its emphasis on the soul's journey and the nature of the divine, had shaped Jesus' understanding of God and humanity's place in the cosmos. But Egypt, according to Carson, was just the first stop on Jesus' journey of spiritual discovery. From the land of the Nile, Jesus had traveled east to the mystical realms of Tibet and India. In Tibet, Carson asserted, Jesus had delved into the practices of Qigong and Reiki, ancient techniques for manipulating energy and promoting healing. These esoteric arts, Carson claimed, had given Jesus the power to perform the miraculous healings described in the Gospels. Carson's narrative painted a picture of Jesus as a spiritual seeker, traveling from one center of ancient wisdom to another, gathering knowledge and techniques that would later form the basis of his teachings. In India, he claimed, Jesus had studied the mystic arts and delved into teachings on reincarnation. These ideas, Carson suggested, had profoundly influenced Jesus' understanding of the soul, life, and death. This portrayal of Jesus as a student of global wisdom traditions was radical, to say the least. It challenged the traditional Christian view of Jesus as the unique Son of God, instead presenting Him as a seeker of truth who had drawn inspiration from a variety of sources. For some, this was a bridge too far, a challenge to the very foundations of their faith. For others, it was a revelation, a way of understanding Jesus that made Him more relatable and his teachings more universal. As Carson's tale of Jesus' lost years unfolded, it became clear that he was doing more than just speculating about a gap in the historical record. He was proposing a radical reinterpretation of Jesus' life and teachings, one that placed him firmly within the context of the ancient world's spiritual traditions. This Jesus was not just the messenger of a new covenant with the God of Israel, but a synthesizer of global wisdom, bringing together the best of what he had learned on his travels and presenting it in a form that would resonate with his Galilean audience. And so, as the dust settled on this latest chapter, 
in Carson's unconventional exploration of religious history, a new question began to form in the minds of his audience. If Jesus had indeed been a student of these ancient wisdom traditions, what else might he have learned? What other secrets might be hidden in the story of his life, waiting to be uncovered by those willing to look beyond the conventional narrative? With these questions lingering in the air, Carson prepared to take his audience on yet another journey into the unknown, promising revelations that would challenge everything they thought they knew about the origins of Christian teaching. The concept of Christ consciousness. In the depths of Billy Carson's controversial theories about Jesus, a concept emerges that transcends the boundaries of traditional religious thought, Christ consciousness. As Carson delves into this idea, he paints a picture of spiritual awakening that challenges the very foundations of Christian belief. With the passion of a visionary, Carson argues that Jesus' primary message wasn't about his physical return, as many Christians believe. Instead, he claims Jesus spoke of the return of Christ's consciousness, a state of heightened spiritual awareness that connects individuals to the divine in profound ways. Carson's eyes light up as he explains this concept, his words carrying the weight of revelation. Christ's consciousness, he asserts, is not the exclusive domain of Jesus, but a state attainable by all. It's a level of spiritual evolution characterized by unconditional love, deep compassion, and an innate understanding of the universe's interconnectedness. As he speaks, one can almost see the barriers between humanity and divinity crumbling in Carson's mind. He envisions a world where each person has the potential to reach this exalted state to become, in essence, Christ-like in their awareness and actions. But Carson's theory doesn't stop at individual enlightenment. He posits that Jesus' true intention was for all of humanity to achieve this state of consciousness. In Carson's telling, Jesus wasn't seeking followers, but fellow awakened beings, each capable of embodying the divine love and wisdom he exemplified. The implications of this idea are staggering. If Carson is right, it would mean that for centuries, Christianity has missed the core of Jesus' teaching. Instead of waiting for a Savior to return, Carson suggests, we should be working towards our own spiritual evolution. As he expounds on his theory, Carson's voice takes on an urgent tone. He believes this message was revolutionary in Jesus' time, and remains so today. It was a call to personal empowerment, an invitation for each individual to discover their own divine nature and live in harmony with the universe. But why, if this was Jesus' central message, has it been lost or obscured over time? Carson's answer is unflinching. He points to the prevailing religious and political structures of the time suggesting that such a message of individual spiritual empowerment was seen as a threat. It was easier, he argues, to control people who believed they needed an intermediary to reach the divine. Carson's narrative paints a picture of a message misunderstood and suppressed. He sees a history where the transformative power of Christ's consciousness was buried under layers of doctrine and dogma. Its revolutionary potential neutralized by those who feared its implications. As he speaks, one can sense the frustration in Carson's voice. He sees a world in desperate need of this awakening, held back by outdated beliefs and misinterpretations of Jesus' true teachings. In his view, embracing Christ's consciousness could solve many of the world's problems, from personal suffering to global conflicts. But Carson's theory isn't without its challenges. It flies in the face of centuries of Christian theology, challenging core beliefs about Jesus, divinity, and uniqueness. For many believers, the idea that anyone could achieve the same level of consciousness as Jesus might seem blasphemous. As Carson's exposition on Christ consciousness draws to a close, he leaves his audience with a profound question to ponder. What would the world look like if we all strive to achieve this state of heightened spiritual awareness? 
How might our relationships, our societies, our very understanding of existence change if we embrace this concept? The Jesus was an alien theory. With the precision of a master storyteller, Carson begins to unravel his theory. He speaks of ancient texts, hidden knowledge, and a cosmic drama that has been playing out on Earth for millennia. In his narrative, Jesus emerges not as the son of a carpenter from Nazareth, but as a being of extraordinary origin and capabilities. The implications of this theory are staggering. If true, it would rewrite not just religious history, but human history as a whole. Carson doesn't stop at Jesus' miracles. He goes further, suggesting that even the cornerstone events of Christian faith, the resurrection and ascension, were the result of alien intervention. Carson's eyes light up as he delves into the details of his theory. He points to the miraculous acts attributed to Jesus in the Bible, the healing of the sick, the transformation of water into wine. These, Carson argues, were not divine miracles, but demonstrations of advanced extraterrestrial technology. Imagine, he says, his voice filled with wonder, a civilization thousands, perhaps millions of years ahead of our own. Their technology would seem like magic to us. And that's exactly what Jesus' contemporaries saw. Magic. Miracles. But it was science, advanced beyond our wildest dreams. As Carson speaks, he paints a picture of Jesus as a hybrid being, part human, part alien. He points to the story of the virgin birth, suggesting that it was, in fact, an early account of artificial insemination or genetic manipulation by advanced beings. Jesus' grandmother, too, enters the narrative, her story found in apocryphal texts that Carson claims hold key evidence of a deliberate alien bloodline. But Carson's theory doesn't stop at Jesus' origins. He delves into the nature of Jesus' abilities, drawing parallels between the miracles described in the Bible and the capabilities of advanced technology. The healing touch becomes a form of advanced medical intervention. The ability to walk on water is explained as a mastery of gravitational fields. Even the resurrection is reframed as a sophisticated form of suspended animation or consciousness transfer. As outlandish as these claims might seem, Carson presents them with unwavering conviction. He speaks of the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, ancient texts that he believes describe beings capable of traversing dimensions and incarnating at will. In Carson's narrative, Jesus was one such being, possessing the power to transcend the boundaries of life and death. Think about it, Carson urges his audience, a being who can choose when and where to incarnate who can manipulate matter at will, who can heal with a touch and raise the dead. Doesn't that sound more like an advanced alien than a simple human? But perhaps the most controversial aspect of Carson's theory is his explanation for Jesus' resurrection and ascension. These events, central to Christian belief, are recast in Carson's narrative as examples of alien intervention. The resurrection, he suggests, was a form of advanced resuscitation, or the transfer of Jesus' consciousness to a new body. The ascension, in turn, becomes a dramatic example of alien technology, perhaps a tractor beam or teleportation device, whisking Jesus away to a waiting spacecraft. As Carson delves deeper into his theory, he touches on the technological capabilities he believes these alien beings possessed. He speaks of rejuvenation chambers, described in ancient texts, which he claims were used to transfer consciousness between bodies and extend lifespans indefinitely. These chambers, Carson asserts, explain how beings like Jesus could live for eons, incarnating repeatedly to guide human development. With the fervor of a true believer, Carson even claims to have located one of these rejuvenation chambers. He describes a visit to the Serapium in Saqqara, Egypt, where he encountered massive stone boxes that he believes were used to create and store bodies for consciousness transfer. These boxes, 
made of granite and diorite, still emit a mysterious energy, according to Carson, a lingering trace of the advanced technology once housed within. As Carson's narrative unfolds, it becomes clear that his theory about Jesus is part of a larger tapestry of belief. In his worldview, Earth has been visited by advanced beings for millennia, their presence shaping human history and religious belief. Jesus, in this context, becomes not just a singular figure, but one of many emissaries sent to guide human development. Yet for all its audacity, Carson's theory requires a radical reinterpretation of historical and archaeological evidence, and, for many, it threatens the very foundations of their faith. But Carson remains undeterred. He sees his ideas not as a threat to faith, but as an expansion of it. In his view, recognizing Jesus as an advanced alien being doesn't diminish his importance or his message. Instead, it elevates humanity, suggesting that we are part of a larger cosmic community with the potential to evolve to similar levels of consciousness and capability. Whether one views Billy Carson as a visionary or a provocateur, his impact on contemporary spiritual and historical discourse is undeniable. His theories about Jesus as an alien being have opened up new avenues of thought and discussion, challenging us to look at familiar stories through an entirely new lens. As we grapple with these ideas, we're reminded that the search for understanding is an ongoing journey, one that often leads us to unexpected and controversial destinations. Reinterpretation of biblical figures and universal consciousness. A new thread emerged from Carson's tapestry of unconventional ideas. With the same unwavering confidence that had characterized his earlier revelations, Carson turned his attention to the very foundations of the biblical narrative. His gaze settled on two figures that have long stood as pillars of Judeo-Christian tradition, Yahweh and Satan. The room fell silent as Carson began to speak, his words carrying the weight of a man about to upend centuries of religious understanding. What if, he began, his voice low and measured, Everything we thought we knew about God and the devil was wrong. Carson's eyes gleamed as he delved into ancient Sumerian texts, documents that predated the Bible by thousands of years. These clay tablets, etched with cuneiform script, held secrets that Carson believed could reshape our understanding of biblical history. And at the center of this reinterpretation stood Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament. In these ancient writings, Carson explained, his voice gaining intensity, Yahweh isn't the benevolent creator we've been led to believe. In fact, the being we've called God for millennia is actually Satan. The statement hung in the air, heavy with implication. Carson let the silence stretch, allowing the magnitude of his claim to sink in. Then, with the skill of a master storyteller, he began to unravel his theory. He spoke of Eden, not as a heavenly paradise, but as an experimental site nestled between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. In Carson's narrative, this Eden was a place of genetic manipulation, where Yahweh, or Satan, as Carson now called him, worked to cultivate genetic diversity among early humans. Think about it, Carson urged, his eyes scanning the room. The God of the Old Testament, the one who demanded blind obedience and punished dissenters. Doesn't that sound more like our traditional concept of Satan? But Carson's reinterpretation didn't stop there. He introduced another player into this cosmic drama, Enki, Yahweh's brother. In Carson's telling, it was Enki who truly cared for humanity, who sought to elevate humans by sharing knowledge of their true potential and the mysteries of the universe. Remember the story of Adam and Eve? Carson asked, his voice taking on a conspiratorial tone. We've always been told that the serpent who tempted Eve was evil, that knowledge was somehow a sin. But what if that serpent was Enki, trying to enlighten humanity? Carson painted a picture of Enki as a benevolent figure, one who saw the potential in humans 
and wanted to help them evolve. The fruit of knowledge in this interpretation wasn't a source of sin, but a key to human enlightenment and autonomy. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit and covered themselves, Carson explained, it wasn't out of shame. It was a symbol of their newfound awareness, their step toward self-determination. As Carson's narrative unfolded, he described how Yahweh, upon discovering Enki's actions, cursed his brother and labeled him as the devil. This, Carson claimed, was the origin of our traditional concept of Satan as an evil entity. It was a smear campaign, Carson asserted, his voice tinged with indignation. Yahweh couldn't stand the idea of humans becoming aware, of them questioning his authority. So he turned Enki, the true benefactor of humanity, into a figure of evil. But even as Carson challenged traditional religious narratives, he was quick to distance himself from modern satanic practices. His beliefs, he emphasized, were rooted in metaphysics and the understanding of universal frequencies rather than in religious doctrine. I'm not an atheist, Carson clarified, his tone serious. I believe in a creator, but not in the way traditional religion portrays it. The creator I believe in is more like a frequency, a universal consciousness that permeates everything. Carson's eyes lit up as he delved into his theory of universal consciousness. He spoke of a vast, interconnected web of energy and information, where each individual being represented a specific point of consciousness drawn from a universal mind. Imagine the universe as an infinite radio broadcast, Carson said, his hands gesturing to illustrate his point. Each of us is like a radio, tuned to a specific frequency. We're all part of the same broadcast, the same universal consciousness, but we each express it in our unique way. This perspective, Carson argued, challenged traditional notions of individuality and divinity. In his view, the separation between creator and created, between God and humanity, was an illusion. All beings, he claimed, were interconnected, part of a grand cosmic tapestry. As Carson's presentation drew to a close, it was clear that his reinterpretation of biblical figures and his theory of universal consciousness had struck a chord with his audience. For some, his ideas offered a fresh perspective on age-old questions of good and evil, creator and created. For others, they represented a challenge to deeply held beliefs and traditions. But regardless of where one stood on Carson's theories, there was no denying the power of his narrative to provoke thought and inspire new ways of looking at the world. His reframing of Yahweh and Satan, his portrayal of Enki as a benefactor of humanity, and his concept of universal consciousness all invited listeners to question long-held assumptions about the nature of reality and our place in the cosmos. Carson's ideas opened up new avenues of thought, challenging listeners to reconsider their understanding of good and evil, of divinity and humanity's potential. The reaction to Carson's claims has been as diverse as it is intense. Some dismiss him outright as a sensationalist or a conspiracy theorist. Others find his ideas intriguing a fresh perspective on age-old questions. And then there are those who embrace his theories wholeheartedly, seeing in them answers to long-held doubts or inconsistencies in traditional religious teachings. Ultimately, whether one accepted Carson's theories or not, his exploration of biblical figures and universal consciousness shows the complexity of spiritual and philosophical questions. Carrying Carson's ideas into the world, one thing is clear. The conversation about the nature of reality, about good and evil, about humanity's place in the cosmos, was far from over. It was just beginning anew, sparked by a vision of the universe that challenged us to look beyond the boundaries of traditional belief and explore the limitless possibilities of our consciousness. Thanks for watching. See you in our next video.